So good morning uh, to everyone. So it's a great pleasure for me to be here and uh, many, many thanks to the Association Costaricense de Derecho de Seguros and uh, al, al Collegio uh, de Abogadas y Abogados de Costa Rica for this uh, invitation. So as uh, Naftali mentioned, uh, I'm not so confident in Spanish with, uh, with the Spanish language, but I will start uh, learning Spanish Saturday. I will have my first class. So I hope to come back to Costa Rica in 2021 to deliver a, a speech during the SILA conference in a Spanish language. In the meantime, I'm sorry, I have to speak uh, in English. So I apologize for that. So if you are uh, uh, familiar uh, with the uh, regulation issued uh, at the international level on uh, financial services, which means uh, banking, uh, financial products and insurance, uh, you know that uh, there's a new regulations uh, uh, such as uh, uh, Basel 3 and 4, uh, such as uh, the uh, Solvency 2 uh, in, in Europe and uh, Mifid 2 always in Europe, uh, they are based on three pillars. Uh, one pillar is uh, the, uh, related to the uh, capital requirements of uh, the entities operating in the different, uh, active, in the different uh, um, activities. The second one is related to the system of governance of these legal entities. And the third one refers to the reporting uh, to the stakeholders, including the supervisory authority. So, with the reference to the uh, consumer protection, in my opinion, uh, the regulation issued by the European Union uh, can be uh, summarized in a three pillars approach that you can see in this slide. So, the first one, uh, which is, how can I say, the most uh, traditional approach, is the customer protection at the point of sale. When I, I make reference to the point of sale, I make reference to the individual relationship between the customer and the, the seller of insurance products. This seller can be an insurance intermediary, such as an agent, a broker, a bank, another um, intermediary, or uh, directly an insurer. And this uh, kind of relationship can be a physical relationship. I have in front of me the customer, but now, uh, due to the new technologies, uh, this uh, relationship can be also uh, realized with uh, uh, distance uh, uh, communication systems. And we have also uh, a totally or partially replace this relationship with uh, algorithms with uh, so-called robo-advice. So, but apart from that, so it's important to understand that the first pillar of this uh, uh, protection is related to the individual relationship at the point of sale. So we are talking about the single contract, a contract signed by Mr. or Miss and related to specific risks. This relationship is a traditionally um, a point of reference of the EU regulation aiming at protect customers. The second pillar, which is uh, an evolution of uh, this uh, protection at the point of sale, is the so-called collective protection. So, um, the, uh, legi the legislator is uh, aware that uh, a protection of each customer uh, is a matter of uh, a single case. But if uh, a product is a manufacturer in a way which is uh, detrimental to all the customers, if a product is uh, distributed in a way which is detrimental to many, many customers, we need to introduce collective protections because uh, does it not make sense a protection of each of the customers, but we have to protect the community of the customers. Then the third pillar, which is the most innovative pillar, 
And this pillar has been introduced recently with the so-called Insurance Distribution Directive, which entered into force in 2018, is, is trying to bring this a business con the business conduct rules, which means all the set of, of rules related to the relationship between the seller and the buyer of insurance, into the organization of the insurers. The business conduct rules are becoming organizational rules of the insurance undertakings. And you can understand that this is quite new, is absolutely new uh, for the European Union. So this is the three pillar approach of the European Union. Now, uh, for the rest of my speech, I will try to explain uh, in details um, how they are articulated this, um, and uh, what are the rules, the relevant rules. So, first of all, why we have increased the customer protection at the point of sale. So, if you take into account almost all the jurisdictions all over the world, you can see that uh, there are rules on the insurance contract, and these rules uh, are always uh, regulating the case of the customer who has to disclose to the insurer its risk exposure. So the idea is that the customer knows much better than the insurer its risk exposure. So the customer has to disclose the risk exposure to the insurer. However, this is, how can I say, an asymmetric information because it means that uh, the customer has to inform the insurer. However, what happens from the insurer, from the insurance intermediaries to the customer? So, in order to balance this relationship, the regulation has introduced, year after year, rules aiming at balance this, re this relationship and how? Increasing the duty to take care of the customer imposed on insurance intermediaries and insurance undertakings. It depends on which one enters into contact, uh, gets in touch with the, uh, with the customer. This is the reason why we have the traditional approach of almost all the insurance act or uh, civil codes, including uh, which deal with insurance, which is now balanced by the emerging area of duty to take care by the uh, regulated entities, insurers, and insurance intermediaries. So, this is the typical, I think uh, there is also in uh, Costa Rica, uh, this is the typical uh, uh, provision of uh, almost all the jurisdictions. The customer knows the risk exposure, so the customer has to uh, uh, has to uh, inform uh, the, uh, the insurer what happens in case of false statement, what happens in case of omissions. There is a penalty in terms of uh, right, the right to get the benefit from the insurer. In addition, in the ongoing life of an insurance contract, the risk uh, can, be, uh, can fluctuate. So we have an increasing of the risk, we have a decreasing of the risk. And in almost all the jurisdictions, the customer has to provide this information to the insurer. In case the customer does not provide this information, there are other contractual penalties. So, what happened? So most of the insurers were more, you know, uh, focused on the results rather than the product. Because the idea was, this is my product. However, I really don't care because uh, you have to inform uh, 
uh, you customer have to inform me about everything. If you do not match exactly what I want, I can refuse or I can reduce my, uh, uh, my benefits. So this is uh, something uh, uh, which is uh, old in time because uh, it depends uh, on the maritime insurance where only the customer had very good knowledge on the risk. However, you know, the social uh, uh, behavior uh, was in sense that this relationship was not very well balanced. This is the reason why we have, at the European level, uh, we have had several directives. A directive is a, a piece of European uh, regulation which, need, which is compulsory for the member states. However, this uh, directive requests member states to implement the directive into their own national laws. How can they do this? They have to adopt an act. And when they adopt an act, they have to transpose, implement uh, the contents of this directive into their own law. And this is compulsory for the member state. They cannot refuse. So we have now this insurance distribution directive, which is, uh, the, thir which is uh, the, um, the directive replacing uh, the previous one, which is called the Insurance Mediation Directive, which replaced another one, another directive. Now, this Insurance Distribution Directive is the most comprehensive set of rules addressed to customer protection in insurance. And this directive replaces the previous Insurance Distribution Directive and works together with another directive, which is quite old, and this is the Directive on Unfair Terms in consumers contra uh, consumer uh, contracts. Uh, this uh, unfair terms in consumer contracts is a so-called horizontal directive because it's not specifically addressed to the insurance products, but it is related to all the contracts. And of course, it applies also to the insurance contracts. These two directives are the main uh, um, the main columns of the customer protection at the point of sale, in the individual relationship. Going in the details, this uh, insurance distribution directive has been influenced by the directive called MIFID II, which means Market in Financial Instruments Directive, which is a directive uh, uh, addressed to financial products. And this uh, means that uh, we are in front in the European Union to a trend which I described as MIFIDization from MIFID of uh, insurance which means that the regulation on insurance is strongly influenced by the regulation on financial products. So we have the first part are general uh, principles of conduct. And the general principle of conduct, which is, has been now introduced by the Insurance Distribution Directive, is a copy and paste of uh, the general principle conduct which have been introduced two years before than the insurance distribution directive by the MIFID II. And uh, what is uh, the, the meaning, the text of this uh, general principle? The general principle of a conduct which apply to all the distributors of insurance products and when I mention distributors, I make reference to both insurers and insurance intermediaries. The principle is that they must always act professionally, fairly, and honestly in line, in accordance 
with the best interests of their customers. This is the general principle which applies to all the relationship between insurers, insurance intermediaries and customers. Of course, you can understand now the issues. What does best interest mean? Because, uh, just to give you an example, if I have a life insurance product, I can have uh, I can understand the best interest. The best interest is to protect or to have a, to borne an investment risk which is of which I'm full aware. However, in all life insurance, it's not easy to, uh, to understand the best interest. The best in is best interest to maximize my coverage? Maybe. However, do you have money enough to pay the premium? On the other hand, maybe it's better for you to reduce the coverage and to increase the self-protection, to increase the introduction of measures to prevent the risk. And this can be also your best interest. So you understand that if we take something with, from the financial sector and everybody can understand the best interest of a customer who is investing money is to invest the money in accordance to his risk attitude. But in non-life insurance is now a nightmare. Anyway, the general principle is to act always in the best interest of the customers. In addition, let me, uh, uh, let me uh, tell you that uh, we are introducing this principle to act honestly, professionally and fairly. However, Almost all, I would say all the jurisdictions, they have a general principle which <laughs> says good faith. So what is the relationship between a good faith, which is the relationship of a fairness, which are general principles in all the civil law jurisdictions, and these principles of fairly professionally, uh, we really don't know now. And so the doctrine is now challenged by these principles. Honestly, professionally and fairly means just the specification of the general principle of good faith, or they are something different. Maybe in 2021, I will tell you something, but now is a question who nobody is able to answer. Then we have the conflict of interests. The conflict of interests are related to the, uh, the position of the, in, of the distributors. Now, when I, when, I talk, when I use the word distributor, I make reference to both insurers and insurance intermediaries. So the distributors needed to manage their conflict of interest or better, they have to avoid their conflict of interest. So we have now a principle that they have to, first of all, identify the conflict of interest. They have to avoid the conflict of interest. And if this is not possible, they have to be transparent in front of the customers. They have, in other words, they have to disclose their conflict of interest. Which is easy to say, but in practice is quite difficult. Uh, because uh, sometimes uh, we have, uh, we don't know if there is a conflict of interest or is it questionable if there is a conflict of interest. 
And uh, this, uh, this uh, topic is uh, strictly linked to another one, which is the remuneration of the distributors. So, you know that uh, the tradition in the insurance market is that uh, the remuneration of uh, the distributor is uh, paid directly by the insurer and, of course, indirectly by the customer because uh, the remuneration is embedded in the premium. However, uh, this is uh, just the first step of the remuneration. The insurance distribution directive is requesting distributors to be clear, to be transparent, in order to all the sources of remuneration. First of all, are you paid as a distributor by an insurer? Are you asking uh, a remuneration directly to the customer? Are you getting a remuneration in form of uh, an economic benefit? Just to give you an example, I am uh, an association of, uh, I am the Collegio de Abogados y Abogadas. And I want to, uh, I want to sign a collective scheme to offer to all of you a protection, maybe liability, uh, liability insurance for your professional activity. So, can I get a remuneration? In this case, probably not. But what happens if you say, it's OK, I don't want to be paid. However, I have 12 conferences a year, and I have to bear the costs of these conferences. So you are my insurer. So you can, for free, <laughs> right? organize these conferences. So, I am uh, the Collegio de Abogados y Abogadas, and I save money because the insurer is affording the costs rather than I. This is a form of remuneration, and I have to disclose this form of remuneration to my customers. And, um, and then, of course, uh, this was a question extremely controversial because uh, at the beginning the European Union wanted to prohibit any form of remuneration paid by the insurers. And this is the system, is called net quoting system, which is adopted in the Baltic countries, Norway, uh, Sweden, Denmark, Finland, they do not allow insurers to pay commissions. They always request distributors to negotiate with the customers a compensation. Do you believe this is uh, the perfect system? A sector inquiry performed by the European Commission, said that this is a good system. However, this can prevent competition. This can be a barrier to the entrance of new players. Let me give you an example. In the European Union, if an insurer is authorized in a country, can apply to its own supervisory authority to be authorized to carry out business in one, more, or all the other EU member states. However, I'm, total, I'm an Italian insurer. I'm totally unknown to the Danish customers. How can I sell my products? If you ask to someone who is an expert in marketing, the answer is, it's okay get in touch with the distributors, and you ask the distributors, what is your commission? Maybe they say 10%. OK, I give you 
But in case of uh, a prohibition, I cannot do this. So at the end of the day, the local players, the local insurers, they have a competitive advantage because this can be a barrier to new players. Because the new players, they find uh, very difficult to get in touch with the customers. Then, this is a principle which is, uh, you know, translated from the financial sector, which is know your customer, know your product. Which means that the insurers, the distributors better, they have to investigate interests and needs of their customers. Customers, do you remember, they have to disclose their risk exposure to the insurer. On the other hand, the distributors, they have to investigate interests and needs of the customers in order to provide a, an insurance product which is, which comply, which is in line with the best interests of the customers. And then, we have also a standardized pre-contractual information set. So, when you, want to, when you get in touch with the distributor, you do not need to read immediately the insurance contract. Distributors are obliged to, uh, to provide a standardized form which has to answer to seven questions. What, what is in, out, how to get the money in case of the event, and so on. Few questions with a limited amount of, of space to answer these questions. The idea was that if I get this three pages document, I can compare the products offered by a multitude of uh, distributors, and then I can choose the one I believe is better for me. Uh, also, this uh, is something which is also controversial, because now we are making some empirical research, and this empirical research, you know, <laughs> they are demonstrating that uh, this information is quite confusing. However, uh, this is another trend, and we have a standardized regulation which works like a balance sheet. In a balance sheet, you know that uh, in the liabilities and the assets, you find something at the beginning and something, uh, something at the top and something at the bottom. And the same happens here. The structure is the same, and this happens in all the European Union, because this is a standardized document. However, as I mentioned, it, we are trying to, you know, increase the collective, uh, the collective protection. So we have to increase this collective protection. Why? Because if a product is not good, per se, so we can introduce the best uh, rules in terms of uh, protection of the individual customer. However, the product is still not good. Or the marketing strategy to sell this product is not good. So we have to avoid this. This is the reason why we have, in addition to the protection at the point of sale, in addition to the protection of the one-to-one -one relationship, we have this collective protection. But how this collective protection works? First of all, this collective protection, you can see, is more in the hands 
of the supervisory authorities than the courts. And you can understand that this is something quite new. Why? The one-to-one -one relationship, the relationship at the point of sale, is a relationship that can go in front of the court in case of mis-selling. The authorities, at least in Europe, they are not allowed to make any kind of a judgment on the individual relationship. It's not a duty of the supervisory authority to protect specifically Mr. or Miss. They have to provide a more general protection, but they are not the judge of the single case. They are now uh, playing an important role in the collective protection. We are protecting all, we are protecting a number of customers, and through this protection, this collective protection, we are protecting each of the customers. This is important. Of course, this means that it's important the border between the individual protection in front of the court and the collective protection which is performed by the supervisory authority. Of course, against the decision of the supervisory authorities, the legal entities, the supervised entities, can go in front of the court because this will be a one-to-one -one relationship between the supervisory authority and the insurer A, the distributor B, and so on. Then, the collective protection. This collective protection uh, is mainly uh, attributed to, the, to a directive which is uh, different from the insurance distribution directive. This directive is the unfair commercial practices directive. Uh, this directive uh, uh, applies to all the relationships, including the insurance relationships. Do you remember I mentioned it before the unfair terms in consumer contracts? which is a directive applying to all the consumers, regardless of uh, the field. And this is the same. This applies to all the relationship, regardless of insurance, banking, uh, uh, electricity, and so on. And how this directive works, and what kind of impact can have in the insurance sector. This, on the uh, right side, you can see that this directive takes into account the unfair practices, which are the misleading practices where I omitted something or I said something which is not true. But this directive is also addressed to the aggressive practices when I force the will of the person with a violence. This is the unfair commercial practices directive, which is uh, the most important form of a collective protection. However, however, in addition to this collective protection, the insurance distribution directive regulated the so-called cross-selling. And in the cross-selling, we have the tying practices and the bundling practices. I'm not sure you are familiar with this, but I will try now to introduce both the uh, cross-selling and the uh, unfair commercial practices. Just to give you an idea, 
of the dimension. In 2013, the Italian supervisory authority, Italy, is the fourth largest insurance market in the European Union and is the eighth largest insurance market in the world. So I think uh, this uh, survey uh, performed by the supervisory authority is, is quite important, right? So they discovered that 10 million coverages were sold through cross-selling and almost all the uh, policy holders they didn't know they were insured. Just to give you an idea, with the reference to the unfair commercial practices, the penalty in Italy is 5 million euros. Of course, the maximum. So you can understand that you have to pay up to 5 million plus the reputational risk. Because, of course, the decision will be on the news. And now we, are, we have a case where, based on the uh, decision of, uh, of the, the, we have the uh, antitrust authority, which is competent in Italy on, uh, um, to uh, counteract the unfair commercial practices and to punish the unfair commercial practices, we have a class action based on the decision of the uh, of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the antitrust authority, which said that this practices practice were, a specific practices was unfair, and now the insurer has to deal with uh, this class action because uh, the policyholder says, "Okay, you have been punished by the uh, by the uh, by the, the, the uh, antitrust authority because of the unfair commercial practices." but I suffered the damage, and you have to pay this damage. At the end of the day, I think you now understand that these two, uh, these two concepts are not theoretical abstractions or constructions, but they are extremely important in practice. So, cross-selling. The cross-selling is, um, you know, is uh, the ABC of marketing, right? So uh, if you talk with a marketing professor, but also if you talk with uh, someone involved in marketing, they know that sometime you can sell a product together with another product for different reasons. First of all, in this way, you can get more money because you get two products rather than one. Then you can increase uh, the, the quality of the product you are selling because you are offering uh, something which complements uh, the basic product. However, and this is positive, uh, the European Commission believes that cross-selling in general terms is positive because customers can increase the quality of uh, the, uh, of, uh, the purchase. However, sometimes happens that the seller, how can I say, can uh, the customer better is imprisoned by the seller. In other words, the seller is in a position to cross-selling everything. I need of a mortgage. I go to a bank. And the bank can say, OK, I give you the mortgage. However, why you do not buy this coverage, which can protect you in case you die, you lose your job, and so the insurer can pay the benefit directly to me, and you avoid to return uh, the mortgage. Perfect. Once again. In Italy, 
according to an inquiry performed by the Italian supervisory authority, sometime 80% of uh, the premium was the commission paid by the insurer to the bank. So the question is, what is the expected loss ratio of a product if you are paying 80% of the premium as a commission? So you understand that something which is positive can be also negative. Of course, the trend is we try to avoid the negative part of a positive practice, which is the cross-selling. So, the principle is that we try to prohibit the tying practices, which are the practice where you offer two products and you say, if you want this product, this product is tied. Otherwise, I do not sell this product. This are, in principle, prohibited. However, They are allowed if the insurance contract is the principal one and the other one is ancillary. The question is when any, a product can be sold together with an insurance product and the insurance product is the principal product and the other product is ancillary. Do you have an idea? I give you the idea, I give you the example. The black box. The black box is a box that you put in your car in order to record your driving style. Everything is recorded and in case of an accident, uh, the insurer is in a position to understand, for instance, if you were driving uh, 200 kilo kilometers fast, and so on. So, this is a product which is ancillary to an insurance product. The insurance product is the principle. We allow this as a tying. So, you can offer an insurance product linked with the, this ancillary product. Outside this case, you cannot do uh, uh, tying practices, but only bundling practices, which means that you can offer uh, always, uh, you, can, you have always to offer the, uh, the customer the chance to buy the products separately. This happens if the insurance product is ancillary to the other product. I want to buy my new car, the main product is the car. If the car dealer wants to sell me the insurance, motor third party liability insurance and so on, the insurance product is ancillary. So the bundling practices is accepted, the time practice is not. But from, a, from my point of view, the distinction, as I explain to you now, is clear. The practice is not. Because you apply a different legal regime based on the concept of ancillary. If the insurance is ancillary, okay, there is a regime. If uh, the other product is ancillary, there is another regime. However, we do not have a definition of ancillary. When a product is ancillary, do we make reference to the seller? You can say, if I go to a car dealer, if the contract is assigned in the premises of a car dealer, the main product is a car. Okay? But I don't know if you know this. Uh, now a trend in the European Union is... Uh, to rent the cars rather than to buy cars. For instance, I don't have the car. But now a trend is I can rent. 
I can rent for two years, three years, and then I can change the car. Okay? You know that uh, you can rent the car at the premises of an insurance agent. You can go to the insurance agent and you can say, can I rent a car for three years? Yes. So in this case, the insurance agent will try to sell the car and uh, the, the renting of the car, of course, and the insurance. What happens? Is ancillary insurance or the renting of the car? And this is another question. In addition, what happens in case of this is the car, this is the insurance, and this is the black box? Which is the principal? Which is the ancillary? And you know that the question is not an academic question. This is a very practical question because if the answer is the insurance product is the principal and the other is ancillary, a time practices, a prime practice is allowed. Otherwise, it's not. And then, unfair commercial practices. First of all, these practices are protecting the consumer. So, please, uh, bear in mind that uh, in the EU law, customer and consumer are not the same. Consumer means any physical person who is acting for purposes which are outside its activity, professional activity, is a business. A lawyer who is buying uh, the professional liability insurance is not considered a consumer because he is buying an insurance product because of his activity. The same lawyer who is buying home, uh, uh, homeowner insurance is considered a, a consumer because he is he's protecting his house. And so this is something outside the fact that he is a lawyer. And then there are the interesting questions. What happens with the insurance of my car? Because maybe for tax reasons, the car is considered a part of my business. So the insurance covering the car is an insurance bought by the, 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 the lawyer within the scope of his uh, activity. I need a car because I have to go to the court or not. But just to give you an idea that Consumer is something different than customer. Customer are all except, the, including the consumer. Customer is a broad definition. Consumer is just a part of customers. This directive is addressed to consumers, not customers, first of all. And then is related to business, to consumer practices. But if you read the definition, it covers any kind of relationship, including advertisement. You do not need to sign a contract to be protected under this directive. You are protected also against deceptive messages, deceptive advertising. Why? Because an advertisement which is false, which is omitting something, is able to bring you to a specific distributor. You go there because of the missing, because of the misleading advertisement. Then, Maybe you will receive a perfect contractual document, 
where, you, where they explain everything in details and clearly. However, you decided to go there because of a misleading message. And this is an unfair commercial practice. Unfair means, and you can find, you know, the, the definition in practice is unfair when he's able to influence the consumer decision. Then we have the misleading, then we have uh, the aggressive practices. And now I give you some example. So, these cases are expressly inserted in the blacklist. The blacklist means that if we are in front of these practices, these practices are always unfair. And these two practices are specifically addressed to insurers. And they are, look, I don't know if they are in your experience. However, the question is, which could not reasonably, and as a matter of, uh, you know, controversial. So, I can ask, the, the, I can ask document as an insurer, however, I cannot ask documents which do not make sense, I ask you. Why? Because these documents are not relevant for the assessment of the event, for the assessment of the loss. But I ask you this just because I want you to, how can I say, to uh, refuse to act, to ask for the, for the benefit. Just to give you an idea. If I ask you to fill a form, but only a form provided by the same agent where you bought the, the, the contract. I think this is unfair. Why? Because uh, if the form is available online, if the form is available uh, uh, at the premises of all the agents distributing on behalf of the insurer, why I need to go to the agent where I bought years ago, maybe this agent is not working, right? Or maybe I moved to another city and only using the form. This is something which does not make sense. Is not reasonably related to the assessment of the risk. And then failing systematically to respond to pertinent correspondence. And of course, now, what does systematically mean? It means that I do not answer to your email, to your letters. Yes. However, what happens in this case? The policy of the insurer is, the insurer is I do not respond, I do not reply to the first letter. Then, if the customers send a second letter, so I reply. And this means that systematically I try to avoid uh, to take care of the customer. These are examples from the practice, not theoretically. And then the third part of my speech, the final one. The idea is to prevent is better than to, you know, uh, to punish someone. We want to prevent misleading actions, misleading behaviors are in the market. Because uh, uh, insurers are providing something which is extremely beneficial for the economic development. However, if an insurer does not play the game fairly, uh, this can have a negative impact on the insurance industry, and this is not good. So, we have to prevent how. And then we have this new 
concept of proto-oversight governance, which is extremely challenging for supervisory authorities. <laughs> Why? First of all, you need to know that the European Union is a legal system under which if you want to manufacture and distribute a new product, you do not need a prior approval or authorization by the supervisory authority. It's not based uh, uh, like the US or Japan. So you can manufacture whatever you want and then you can market. However, we want to prevent that something which is manufactured in a very bad way can be distributed. How can we do? And with the product oversight and governance. The product oversight and governance is a challenging for insurers. Why? Because it's asking insurers to be focused on the insurance products in addition to their activity on the solvency of the insurers. From a political point of view, uh, in, uh, the satisfaction of customers is more important than the solvency of an insurer. Of course, in case of insolvency, there, are, there is an impact. But now, with the new capital requirements, the possibility of insolvency is quite, you know, uh, is very, very narrow. It's very, very important, uh, the customer protection. So, is it challenging because uh, they need skilled people which have to understand the products and they have to work just in time. If the product is manufactured at the time at zero and is distributed at the time at zero plus one, if the supervisory authority uh, can act against the insurer at time at zero plus 10, you understand that from zero plus one to zero plus 10, the distributor sold a lot of bad products. If you anticipate your intervention at zero, the best is zero plus one, or zero plus two, so you are promptly intervening on the product. And you are preventing this product is distributed, is making losses. How does the system work? First of all, pro oversight governance means Procedures which are requested to insurers in order to manufacture and distributing products in line with the best interests of their customers. We have new words. Manufacturer. Manufacturer means an insurer, but manufacturers better. Co-manufacturers can also be insurance intermediaries. If the insurance intermediaries are, are playing a key role in the design of the product, they became co-manufacturer together with the insurer. Then we have the target market, which is something new. Then we have the distribution strategy. This product oversight governance applies to all the products except the large risks. The large risks in the EU law are the risks, um, uh, there are three different categories, but in, in, in general terms we can say the risks uh, borne by entities which are able to protect themselves. Just to give you an idea, uh, if I am a flight carrier and I'm buying uh, the uh, aircraft's liability, we assume that uh, you have uh, knowledge enough and uh, you can be supported by you know, experts to negotiate with insurers. So you don't need the legal protection offered by the customer protection rules. 
And this is the different steps of this process called product oversight governance. Insurers, in general manufacturers, they have to identify a target market. A target market means a group of customers whose needs and interests the product wants to satisfy. And you say, ah, oh, this is not something new. All the insurers are doing this. Yes, but the approach requested is different. Usually, when you identify a target market, you are trying to find the people who have money enough to buy the product. In this case, you have to add, I would uh, please note, add, which does not mean to replace. You have to add to this profitable customer a demonstration. You know their interests and needs. You know what kind of risks they are exposed to. And you have to demonstrate that your product is dealing with these risks. I mentioned before the uh, uh, protection in case of a mortgage. If the package is sold, is includes the risk of unemployment, my understanding is that this product is addressed to someone who is an employee. However, if the customer is a lawyer, so he is paying a premium for a risk. Which, which, uh, which is not exist, because for a lawyer this is not an employment, an unemployment. So this is the reason why insurers, manufacturers are requested to demonstrate that they know interests and needs of the customers. And of course, interesting questions: How do they know? They say hey, collecting data. However. Do they comply with the rules on the privacy? Because in the European Union, we have the most restrictive legislation on privacy protection. It's called the GDPR, general, uh, is a general regulation on data protection. So you have to demonstrate that the data comply with the law, the collection of this data, and then you have to demonstrate that you know interest and needs. Then what do you do? You have to perform the scenario analysis. You have to demonstrate that in case of a stress, in case the scenario changes, the product is still matching interest and needs of the target market. Then you have to identify, to select an adequate distribution channel. And then you have to provide information to this distribution channel about the product and the target market, but also on the distribution strategy. I recommend you to sell this product with advice rather than to sell this product without the advice, where the advice is now regulated by the insurance distribution directive. It's not something, uh, you know, theoretical, but is now expressly regulated. Then, distributors, they have to demonstrate that they have understood the target market and the key characteristics of the product. Know your product before then you know your customer. Then, there is another activity which is called the monitoring. Both the distributors and the manufacturers, they have to monitor the distribution of insurance products. And the monitoring is a functional to the review of the product. Maybe the product was very good when we designed it, but after years, it's not good. Maybe the product is good, but the distribution is not good. We have to, we need this data, and we need to manage this data. And then, why? Because we have to adopt the remedial actions. The insurers, together with distributors, they have to fix the mistake in the distribution, maybe in the product, which is easy to say, very difficult uh, to do. Then, 
This is the, you know, I summarize the different steps of the process. And you understand that this process is challenging for insurers, but it's also challenging for the uh, supervisory authorities because uh, they need to be on time when uh, the product is made. And you understand that now the products are also sold through the InsurTech. If you have algorithms that are managing the selection of the customers, they are managing uh, the claims, they are managing uh, several activities of the distribution cycle, and they have to demonstrate, they need to know how these uh, algorithms work. And you understand this is not easy, especially if the algorithms are made not inside the insurer, but through the outsourcing in other jurisdictions. What happens if an insurer is outsourcing uh, the manufacturing of algorithms in country which are not under the jurisdiction of EU authorities? If the software house is in India, what can we do? So the theory of the gatekeepers means that uh, if the insurer is authorized in Europe, the insurer is liable for everything. Then the, the insurer can have an action against uh, the outsourcer, but in front of the supervisory authority, the only liable is the authorized entities. You are authorized, you are responsible. You cannot uh, prevent your liability through the outsourcing. However, we need to have uh, skilled people at the supervisory authorities to fully understand these processes. And this is the big challenge for the authorities, but not because uh, uh, Professor Marano is, tell, is telling this, but because if you listen, the president of EIOPA, which is the European uh, um, uh, Authority on Insurance, he said, this is a big challenge for us. We need to recruit these skilled people, and we need to do now. We cannot say we will do it the next five years. And then the last section. Uh, the system of internal controls within the insurer, which means under the EU law, is composed by the risk management function, the internal audit function, the compliance function, the actuarial function. This, uh, this uh, uh, system of internal control has to report to the board of directors. They are involved now in the manufacturing and the review, monitoring and reviewing of the insurance products. They have to make reports to the board of directors in order to inform the board that the product is manufactured in accordance to the law or they have to report if something is going wrong. This is the reason why I said the business conduct rules, which are the rules uh, aiming at to protect the uh, customer in their relationship with the insurer, moved from an individual protection at the point of sale to a dimension, the last one, where the conduct of the insurer is monitored by the same insurer with his independent bodies working within the insurer, uh, within the insurer organization, which are the four key functions I mentioned before. So this is an organizational role of, of the insurer, which is uh, supervised by the authority in order to demonstrate that this structure is working well, including the monitoring on the product oversight and governance. At the end of the day, so you can find that uh, uh, the European Union is uh, trying to apply a principle which is, uh, this is quite funny, uh, which is uh, not uh, stated in the Insurance Distribution Directive, but is in the Directive Solvency 2, which is the directive related to the capital requirements, the system of governance, and the reporting 
together with uh, other rules uh, of insurance and the reinsurance undertakings. The main principle, the main purpose, but uh, of the insurance regulation and supervision in the European Union is customer protection. This is clearly stated, financial stability, the sound and prudent management of the insurers are ancillary to this principle. We are uh, monitoring the solvency of the insurer because we want to protect customers. We are uh, monitoring a sound and prudent management of, the, of uh, the insurer because we want to protect customers. We have a set of rules which is specifically addressed to customer protection. In other words, we want to avoid, unfortunately, uh, this is uh, in Italian, but I hope you can understand, uh, we want to avoid this, that in case of the event, the answer of the insurer is, yes, the coverage covers all, all except what happens, which is, I don't think, uh, you know, the best approach. So now, I think uh, I was 90 minutes, and I was just in time, including the three minutes of delay for, you know, for the logistic uh, question. So if you have questions, uh, I would be happy. Otherwise, thank you for your attention.